Thanks, Amanda. I am so excited to be here with Dr. Walensky and Dr. Nunez-Smith for this panel, which I think will be really informative. I wanted to start with what's in some ways maybe the most obvious question, which is just quite simply looking ahead, what are the biggest challenges we still face when it comes to reaching women and especially Black women and Latinas who have borne so much of the brunt of this pandemic and making sure that they're actually able to access vaccines? Maybe I'll just start and say thanks for having us. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think we should just pause for a quick minute and say we are a year into this pandemic. And if you had asked anybody a year ago, they would have never said that we would have three um, highly efficacious vaccines in a year's time. And I would say, well, we have been moving quickly. The science has not suffered. Um, the, the, we've enrolled over 100,000 people collectively in these clinical trials. Um, we've had a lot of disease, so they've enrolled quickly and we've gotten outcomes quickly. But, but the fact that we have three vaccines um, that we know are safe, that we know are efficacious, um, ready to put into the population is truly um, a, a, a historic scientific feat. Um, so one might have thought that that wasn't possible and here we are, it's possible. So now we actually have to do the next really thought to be impossible, but we're gonna make it possible thing. And that is to get it into 300 million Americans. And so that is the hard work of what we're engaging in and what we're doing. And you're exactly right to ask the question of how we're gonna get it to people who, um, to, you know, people who want it and how do we get it to people who may be hesitant to have it now, but who with more information about, um, about the science, about the safety, about their individual risks, how do we ensure that they feel the confidence in this vaccine to then take it? Maybe with that, I'll pass it to, to Dr. Nunez-Smith um, and then we can keep going. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Walensky. And just echoing my appreciation to be here in conversation today um, with you as well as Shafali and everyone else. You know, this is absolutely top of mind, right, for all of us, is making sure that the vaccination campaign reaches everyone. You know, Dr. Walensky rightly said this is a remarkable moment to have three, right, not one, not two, but three um, vaccines that are, are safe. And I know a lot of questions that, that I hear about are about safety, um, but are safe and also uh, highly efficacious. You know, that's just part of it. So absolutely, we need to make sure that people have their questions um, heard, answered by people who they trust. I think that is just top priority, making sure that all the trusted messengers out there have the good information. We are working so hard against misinformation and disinformation that's out there. You know, if I had a, a dollar for everybody that sends me something that, um, that actually there is no scientific evidence for, my kids would all have their college funds taken care of, right? I mean, we have to get ahead of some of the, the information that just travels so quickly, um, but isn't, isn't true. And I think, you know, there is the differentiation um, between kind of people who are seeing things perhaps in social media, and I think rightly asking. And, and then what I think is sad in this moment, which are others who are trying to take advantage of, of people really having the right to have these questions, but kind of coming in and saying, you know, all vaccines are, are bad in this moment and trying to push different agendas that are really political. So, you know, I think it's important we just, you know, take that step back and say, we honor, we respect everybody's questions. We will meet you where you are. You know, as an administration, no one is here peddling or selling, right, vaccines. We wanna bring information. We know people are smart and will make good choices, right choices for themselves and their families with more information. And so that is a lot of what, you know, we're gonna lean into and lift up in this work to reach kind of everyone in the vaccination campaign. And I mean, maybe thinking off, right, the relatively recent news around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which, I mean, the science is pretty clear that this is a, a powerful vaccine, right, for preventing against severe illness, for preventing against death, but there clearly are concerns a lot of folks have about how it compares to, to the other products on the market. And I guess I'm wondering, do, do you have plans or specific messaging or education involved to, to help reach folks who are nervous about the vaccine? And is that a concern that you're navigating right now? 
I think one thing we have to remember in these studies is they were not compared head to head. I don't think we can actually say that uh, how Johnson & Johnson performed compared to how Pfizer or Moderna performed because they were compared at different times of the pandemic with different levels of variance in the population. So I don't think these are direct comparisons. I think that what we should say and what FDA has said and especially what on the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices at CDC says is there is actually currently no known preference for any given vaccine for any given population. Um, so with that sort of being the guidance from both the FDA and as well as from the CDC, the real question is which is the vaccine that either is available to you because the real goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible as quickly as possible. And then there are certain um, conveniences that make one preferable potentially over another, both in terms of how they get distributed and their ease of distribution, and then in terms of um, patient preferences as to how many times they can or are able to re uh, return. Yeah, absolutely. I echo all, you know, and I think that there are some key pieces of information that are always worth revisiting and sharing with folks who are asking about vaccines, right, and the process in particular. You know, so one of the things, and I think for, you know, we mentioned and talked about communities of color, you know, one of the things I think is really important for people to know is just the representation at each level of this work. You know, when we think about the scientists who have been toiling and thank you to them um, and all those researchers for their work, you know, when we think back historically to some of the darker moments like Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks, you know, one of the things that was problematic was the lack of representation in terms of the scientific workforce. And it's completely different now. And the development for all the vaccines really features that kind of diverse representation, not just in those scientists, but also in the participants in the clinical trials. People need to be able to see themselves in trials and we can do that for all three of these vaccines. You know, 30%, a little bit over that for Pfizer and Moderna in terms of people identifying as being of color. And that number much higher, even for Johnson and Johnson up around 50%. And so, you know, that's very, very important. And then in the processes, Dr. Walensky talked about, those processes are free of political interference. Those are independent scientists working with the data. They are transparent. And again, there is diverse representation uh, on those groups and bodies as well. So I think it's just really a great opportunity we have today to pull the curtain back and let people know exactly kind of how these processes go. I have a lot of faith and confidence in, in the process that, that got us to this point. So do you have plans perhaps to, to do outreach that's maybe targeted toward different groups that may have different reasons for being concerned about when to take a vaccine, what kind to take, whether there's a difference? Um, maybe I'll start in the big picture and say that we've done a lot of um, communicating with our state, local, uh, tribal, and territorial partners. We know at, at the federal agencies that that it is those those places that know their localities and they know their people, right? So we can sort of help distribute the vaccine, but they're really going to be the ones that we're going to follow their guidance with regard to um, how they best reach their people. So that's sort of for the state supply. We um, last week had a CDC vaccine forum. We had participations from all 50 states, from 120 tribes, um, from, from all sorts of uh, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations to give us their best practices. What are the things, the creative things that they're doing that have made that work? At the federal level, there's a partnership with FEMA and the CDC to look at social vulnerability index and census to see if we can put mass vaccination centers in places that are the most vulnerable so people, we can bring vaccination to them. On, in addition to that, we're trying to bring vaccination to them through, um, through mobile units. How do we take those federal pharmacy, uh, those federal vaccination centers, those community vaccination centers that can vaccinate up to 6,000 people a day, but then do further outreach from there on mobile units to really uh, spread that outreach as, as much as we can. And then we have federal pharmacy partners that um, are allowing us to, to partner with pharmacies to, um, we know that 90% of people live within five miles of a pharmacy, can we get place, uh, vaccine to pharmacies where people generally trust their pharmacy? And then finally, we're distributing it to federally qualified healthcare centers. We're hoping, um, we're planning to, that um, over 250 federal uh, federally qualified health centers will actually have access to vaccine in the week ahead. So we're really interested in those partnerships and trying to make sure we get the outreach to as many places as possible. And then maybe um, Dr. Nia Smith can talk about the sort of on the ground community-based partners as well. 
Yeah, invaluable, right? I mean, this the, the success really hinges on the deep partnerships with community-based organizations, faith organizations, those trusted leaders. You know, I just want to underscore the importance of access as a communication and outreach strategy, right? We have to make sure that people, when it's their turn and when they're at yes, that vaccination is easy, right? So we've thought about important structural barriers, making sure vaccines are free, for example. And then of course, some of those innovative strategies that were shared at the CDC forum, things like making sure community-based organizations can help with pre-registration, making sure we're holding slots and spots for particular communities that have been hardest hit, expanding the hours when people can access vaccine and vaccination. So access is part of our communication strategy, right? We're not here just to talk, we're acting, we're doing, we're gonna show up and make vaccines available in community and easy to access. And then, you know, on a, a national scale as well, very much in the final stages is a national public um, education campaign. And it is important that we do think about the tailoring of the message. Um, to your point, right, people will have different concerns and, and we see different groups, even we've been talking some of communities of color, we see some skepticism in our rural neighbors as well. Like we have to be able to reach out and communicate addressing head on what people's concerns are. And so that public education campaign that's about to be launched will do just that. Think about tailoring of the message and of course the trusted messenger as well. Maybe one final note to just say that um... Not everybody wants a vaccine today, but as they see their neighbors getting the vaccine, they may be ready to take the vaccine next week. And so we need to make sure that there are options for people to come back, right? If you passed up your opportunity today, that doesn't mean a forever pass up. That means that we're still available to you if you wanna come back. 100%. Thinking about measuring sort of success, right? Um, one thing I have thought about a lot is sort of the data that we have and data that we don't have when we think about diversity and equity in, in incidents of COVID, in incidents of comorbidities and in vaccines. Um, and I mean, it seems really clear that we do have these big holes in, in race and ethnicity data and we have shortcomings as well, right? In our historic collection of data for LGBTQ plus people. And I, I would love to hear a bit about what plans you have to, to address those longer held demographic issues in data collection and, and why that's important, especially now. Yeah, you know, I I can I can start because um because I'm obsessed with this this point. Um, and you know, we we do we definitely need data to drive equity. I mean, that's at the core of, of what you're asking. Is it's hard for us to to know and set our targets right when we when we have data gaps. Um, so it is important and it is a priority to improve data collection along all the lines you're talking about, including race, ethnicity, you know, the president kind of day one, day two executive orders spoke directly to data and made a whole of government call for us to improve our data collection for response and looking forward to recovery. Um, so this is very um, fundamental and foundational to the work that we're doing uh, in the administration. You know, I, I would also say that kind of while we are doing lots and working very closely collaborative to improve the both collection and reporting of race and ethnicity. And Dr. Wolinski can talk more about that because CDC is at the, the forefront of that. You know, it doesn't slow us down from actually saying, well, how do we get to equity with the data that we do have? And so having metrics like the CDC Social Vulnerability Index that we can lean into um, and use at this time to help target resources, incredibly important. Um, but I, I would say your point is well taken. There are many groups who are invisible in our data, right? And that can be uh, folks who are LGBTQ plus, um, you know, how long did it take us to even have a better idea what was happening in uh, indigenous communities in this country? Do we still know what's happening in all our prisons and jails and detention centers fully? Um, so every time we kind of let the data hold us back, we are in fact making a choice um, for what gets priority, priority and what gets, what gets acted on. But data and better data and being data driven is at the core of the work that we're doing. And maybe what I'll add is, um... To highlight the reason that this is important, we've had two MMWRs just in the last month, one that demonstrated increased risks of um, mental health challenges associated with COVID, um, high rates, higher rates in Hispanic populations. We've had another MMWR that looked at um, rates of comorbidity uh, uh, that would increase your risk of COVID-19, higher rates in the LGBTQ population. So all of these things 
demonstrate to us we need to have these data so that we can we can um, follow these and intervene. So I'm um, really what I would say is I'm committed to the work that we are doing. CDC to the uh, work that uh, Dr. Nunez Smith is facilitating with our work to make sure that these data are available. And then finally, these data have been not available for years. So finally, let's stand on the shoulders of all the work that we're doing now so that we can do this for every health outcome we're looking at in the future. Shifting gears slightly, one thing that, that we have talked a bit about, right, is sort of the challenges around prioritizing equity. And one thing I've been hearing about a lot from, from public health experts is potential concern around some of the states that are abandoning, right? The, the priority group guidelines in favor of a strict age ban system for, for vaccines. And, and the concern there, right, is the implications for racial equity. And what I wanna ask you is, I mean, have you been in touch with states that are making this shift? And if we do in fact see this having a a negative impact in terms of addressing racial inequity, is there a role or a place of the federal government to step in? Yeah, so I can, you know, I can start us on that. And, and certainly, you know, federal guidance um, and federal prioritization, you know, I, I think that what we suffered from as a country for, for far too long in this pandemic was lack of federal coordination and lack of federal guidance. And so I think that um, you know, for certain the Biden Harris administration is fully, fully committed to bringing all the resources of the federal government to bear. And that includes the scientific expertise that has shaped the priority guidelines um, that are issued through the CDC um, and ACIP, which Dr. Walensky will talk more about. Uh, you know, we have to, we have to be centered on equity in this work. You know, this is one of those occasions where it's both the right thing to do, but also the only way, right? For us to be able to get to a new normal on the other side of the pandemic, everyone has to be brought along in this work, right? When we talk about vaccination, vaccination campaigns only work when we reach everybody who really is medically eligible to take the vaccine. And so we have to stay top of mind, equity does not happen by default. It never has, and it won't happen that way now. But you know, directly to your question, we do work very, very closely with states and, and local uh, health officials. Dr. Walensky mentioned that. We talk uh, on the team many, many, many times a week with governors and leaders and um, all those health officials on the ground who are thinking about implementing their strategies. Um, and we are here at very eager always to provide technical assistance to help people achieve the goals that are set, which is to achieve equity in terms of, of the vaccine. Perhaps I'll um, just add a couple of points. One is uh, when the administration turned over at the end of January, it was very clear that there were some states that had too much vaccine on the shelf because they were so stringent in their requirements and as to who would get it. And that by, by having those such tight requirements that they were unable to distribute vaccines fast enough. There were other states that, as you said, opened up a very wide spigot and there were too many people in line. And so what we spent a lot of time early on doing is making sure we could have the, the need meet the supply. Um, and we're still working on that, right? Because we know that the supply has been less. I do think that somewhere in the weeks to month ahead, we're going to be in an inflection point where we're gonna have more vaccine and we're gonna have people who want it. And what we really need to do now is to ensure that the hard work that we're doing in all all of this outreach and all of this, um, all of this sort of groundwork that we're trying to do to reach community organizations and messaging and, and to counter mis and disinformation is going to really reap benefits when we have so much vaccine. And as Dr. Nunez Smith said, it, you have to redouble your efforts in all of this because if we're going to reach equity, um, it's not going to happen because we want it to. It's going to happen because we're going to work twice as hard to get there. The other thing I just want to note is that um, if we are to combat variants, and we haven't talked really about variants yet, but if we're going to combat variants, you have to have the vaccine reach the places where the, where the virus is replicating. If it's replicating in hardest hit communities, the vaccine has to reach there or you're going to get variants. And so it is our response. It's not even our responsibility because it's the right thing to do. It's scientifically proper also to decrease the amount of virus that's replicating. I recently had someone phrase it to me in the context that sort of reaching the folks who are most vulnerable is 
like, yes, the, the correct public health approach, right? And it sounds like that's sort of what you're saying as well, that to this really isn't a negotiable option going forward. Um, exactly. Variant, the variants do take me also to sort of the other thing that has been on the minds of so many of, especially our audience, right, which is the question of schools. And I know the CDC has spent so much time on this issue. I'm sure you're tired of talking about it. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is, I mean, cases, as, as we saw just recently, they are plateauing, it seems, at really high levels. And I know the guidelines were put out at the end of February, but are we going to have to revisit those reopening guidelines? And what practically will the country have to look like for us to actually see, right, kids of all ages in school five days a week, and in-person school, that is? Right. I, um, we spent a lot of time on this guidance and we're always looking and revisiting the science that leads to this guidance. The guidance was intended to be sort of a, a document that we could update, but not necessarily intended to be one where we had to um, shift from, from the prevalence, right? Because we, we, and we have all these different levels of disease. And so we really walk through what we believe to be possible with the current level of the evidence given the disease out there now. The problem should follow is that there's still a lot of disease out there. Um, I think the, the biggest problem was that it was so very bad at the end of January um, you know, two, two and 300,000 cases a day, extraordinarily high cases, case numbers, extraordinarily high death rates. But even though we're at a quarter of that and people are like, have had enough of this already, um, that, you know, that feels like now is the time to, to sort of liberalize what we've been doing. And in fact, it's not. We are at the peak of where we were over the summer. Um, and so, and it happens to coincide with two like critical moments. One where we're really worried about variants taking off and the other counterbalancing that where we like almost have a huge amount of vaccine, right? So what we're really asking people to do is, is be patient to have the vaccine one win and not the variant one win. The school guidance does give us um, ways to open schools safely. Um, we are not asking schools to close or not even suggesting that schools close that have been open safely. What we're saying is if you have been closed, these are, this is the roadmap to get you to open. Yeah, I would, you know, I would also just add that it's important as we think about equity to talk about the resources that are, that are necessary in order to really implement the guidance that the CDC has put out. And I think that's kind of what you see um, legislatively being advanced as well. We just have to have, you know, an overdue conversation in our country about how educational resources are not, um, are not evenly distributed across communities. Uh, and if ever, right, it's now again for us to try to get ahead of the educational inequities that we know pre-existed, as with all the inequities, the pandemic have been worsened and exacerbated by them. And so it is, it is urgent, right, for all our children, um, but particularly kids who have been sort of left behind to be in school, right, and to be in school safely. And so we need to also lift up that resource need and resource conversation. And maybe just acknowledge that when the kids are in school, um, all parents suffer, but it's the women parents who suffer more. Yes. yes. Um, I know we're running short on time, and I have two questions that I really want to get to. And the first is, is, I mean, they're both thinking about the post-COVID world, which right, is so, so much on the horizon for us. And I, I, like so many health reporters before the pandemic, thought a lot about health insurance reform, which we know is an issue that is really important to women, right? The cost of healthcare is, is such a gendered concern. And I'm wondering, do the two of you see a role for yourself in the debate over health reform once the pandemic is behind us? And more critically, has the past year changed how we think about either a public option or a Medicare for all? I think this pandemic is going to change a lot of how we think about, um, about the cost of healthcare, about access to healthcare. And, and so I, I think I would be out way over my skis if I started talking about exactly what healthcare reform looks like. I think we need public health reform. I think we need, we need so many things. I worry about the day where 
where the vaccine will no longer be free. I worry about the day when the vaccine, you know, what about all those people? What about the, the if we need a third booster? What happens then? Um, who's going to pay for that? So I think there are an extraordinary number of questions that are going to be associated with how this pandemic is going to be paid for, um, how the future of healthcare is going to be paid for, how the future of public health is going to be paid for, because we, we are a product of the fact that we did not invest in that. Um, and I think all of those things are going to be have, have to be on the table moving forward. Yeah. And I would just add to Dr. Walensky's list, right? If we're thinking about how vaccines will be paid, but what about therapies, therapeutics, right? Uh, there, there are sort of all these COVID-19 resources that are just essential tests, right? As well as, of course, PPE, right? As we continue to know what works well, we need to do that. The therapies and the vaccine. You know, one of the, the kind of the lesions we, we had coming into the pandemic was this very unequal access to high quality health care. You know, as we talk about things like underlying uh, co-occurring conditions, right, a, a lot of that reflects really what are holes and gaps uh, in coverage for many in our country. So I think we will have a reckoning with what kind of health care looks like moving forward. You know, agree one of our most proximal lessons to learn is around the public health workforce. Um, this is a commitment the president has made is to build out a public health jobs core. Um, you know, the, the real power and value of community health workers, many of whom are women, and making sure that we ladder for them career potential, right? So this isn't kind of some sort of seasonal um, occupation or job for them. How do we think about people's careers? And, you know, what I always say is coming out of this, when we center on equity, we have to make sure there are pathways to both educational as well as economic opportunity and promise for people. That is how we move forward into a, a time of resilience um, and are better prepared, quite frankly, for the next time. And I mean, building off of that, which is gets to the last question I had for both of you, which is, this obviously, right, was in some ways the big pandemic we'd been hearing warnings about for so long, but it seems unlikely it would be the last one. And are we prepared for the next pandemic to hit all of us? And what lessons have we learned thinking about equity and disparities that we can apply to, to future pandemic preparation and response? I'm an infectious disease doc, so maybe, maybe I will say, <laughs> you know, in the last 20 years, we've had anthrax, we've had Ebola, We've had H1N1, we've had Zika, um, we've had, uh, you know, we've had COVID. Um, there's probably others I'm not even thinking of. We had SARS, we didn't pay attention to SARS. Um, this is not the last. Um, it's the reason that you have a whole future cadre of people who are interested in infectious disease because it changes all the time and it's global. And so if we can't learn now the lesson of the importance of investing in, a, in public health, um, then, then shame on us. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, and this question is, we have to, I mean, this is, we have to learn, we have to be prepared. You know, I think the CDC is doing just amazing and in a short period of time thinking about all the important infrastructure that needs to be in place you know even if we think about things like genomic surveillance for the variants I mean there's just a lot that's already been done that is going to be there for future as well you know specific to the question of where do we go in terms of equity it is my deep honor and I'm humbled to to be serving as chair of the COVID-19 health equity task force the president has charged this group um, to come together and to make recommendations about response really importantly recovery and 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 all the next times right that we won't have to have this predictability that has become just tiresome for so many of us to know exactly where um which communities and who will be hit the hardest we have to disrupt that predictability that's going to be the work of the task force all right well thank you both so much this i've learned a lot from this conversation i'm really grateful to have had it have i not asked you anything that you think we should have discussed or that you want the audience to know Maybe I will just say to um, to sort of personally commit to what Dr. Nunez Smith and I have committed to um, to ensure. I mean, we are our best um, communicators for for other people. We can send the message. I, I have people sort of wearing a sticker. I got vaccinated. I wearing a wristband. I got vaccinated. Having a conversation. Did you get vaccinated? I, um, you know. 
I, I think we should be having these conversations. We should be the ambassadors of this message in our own communities. Your voices are loud. And then to redouble your efforts and commit and, and think through how we can help our neighbor either by, by, um, by be becoming a public health official in some way, shape or form yourself, being a contact tracer, doing, doing something, giving of yourself towards this pandemic and towards the future of our public health. Absolutely. I, I want to just thank people for what they're doing and double down on that. It's a call to action, right? Your voice is power. Use it, right? Use it in policy spaces. Use it to be kind to your neighbors, right? Use it to inform your friends, your family, right? Your community about what we need to do so we all benefit from scientific discovery, right? That we all make it to the other side of this pandemic. So just with gratitude, right? And hope and optimism and light. Be well. Thanks so much. Right. Thank you. Thanks for following.